Our chapter today is going to be covering Late Antiquity and Byzantium. And I first want to go ahead and kind of define the area of time that we're going to be covering. So with Late Antiquity, this is going to be the period marking the end of the classically rooted Roman Empire and the rise of Christianity. So we're still technically in the Roman Empire during this time. The late antiquity chapter that we're covering this week primarily addresses Christian art. The earlier chapter that we cover, the Roman Empire, focuses on more classically produced art over that polytheistic type of culture. So some of the major events in the Roman Empire and late antiquity that we've seen already was in 293, Diocletian establishes the Tetrarchy, the rule by four, and divides the Roman Empire into the eastern and western halves. About a decade later, Diocletian is going to retire, the Tetrarchy collapses into civil war, and that's where we have these types of artworks being created of the four rulers. When we move on to Constantine, in 312, he defeats Maxentius at the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, consolidating his power over the western half of the empire. And that's where we get Constantine's arch. Of course, this is an uh, arch that he never saw because he left Rome afterwards. In, thir in 313, he's going to sign the Edict of Milan, which ends the persecution of Christians. And then further on in 324, Constantine defeats Licinius and attains control over the entire Roman Empire. And then we can skip down to the last entry at 330, Constantine moves the capital east to the city of Byzantium, which later is going to become Constantinople. And he declares himself ruler of a united Roman Empire. Unfortunately, the empire does not stay united, and it's going to split into the eastern and western halves once again. But for the map that I want to point out to you of where we're going to be looking today is the city of Rome in Italy. Slightly above that is the city of Ravenna. And then also on the eastern half of the empire is going to be the city of Constantinople. We're also going to see some religious changes take place as we saw with the Edict of Milan that legalizes Christianity. So we're switching basically from a polytheistic culture, both Egypt, Greece, Etruscan, and Romans believed in that, and now we're moving to a monotheistic culture, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. These are all religions governed by text, a book, a written record of God's will. And we also have to define the term pagan here. So this is a pejorative term used by Christians in late antiquity to refer to a person who is a polytheist, someone who believes still in multiple gods. Today, though, the word is used to refer generally to a believer in more of the Roman religion and mythology prior to the beginning of Christianity. So our first artwork is going to be actually architecture. It's going to be the Church of Santa Costanza. And the first thing you should note about this church is that it is round. It is not at all like the common churches that we're going to see more during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. So this is what's called a centrally planned church. It's very much radial in terms of balance. So everything emanates from a central point. And these structures would have been originally tombs or places that offered baptisms. And they were normally called baptistries. Uh, Santa Costanza is located in Rome. And this is going to be a later church that we'll cover generally in the second part of the survey course. Uh, the Florence Cathedral, also called the Santa Maria del Fiore. Um, there are three components to a cathedral complex. There's the cathedral itself. In this case, uh, the building itself was built in 1296 by Arnolfo de Cambio. To the right of that, that tall tower structure is the bell tower. 
and that was designed by the artist Giotto in the early 1300s. And then the building in front of those is the baptistry. So this is kind of like that shape of Santa Costanza. It is a centrally planned church and it would have been it would have predated the other structures behind it. As we get into the Middle Ages and such, we're going to have this type of church, a cross-shaped church. So we have a nave, which we enter uh, at the very bottom of the cross. This is where the congregation is going to sit. You can see that we've got a barrel vault on top uh, that leads us up to the altar. But the cross shape, the crossing, is also called the transept. And this is, again, a barrel vault, and it's going to house the private chapels of the more wealthier families in these cities. So here's another image of Santa Costanza, and we'll enter through the doors here. And this is an old engraving of what this church used to look like. I wanna call your attention to the wonderful ambulatory, this curved barrel vault that goes around the center, around the altar. And I also want you to check out those columns. They're side by side, Corinthian pedestals uh, on top. And this is how they look. So we can definitely denote these as Roman. And these mosaics are absolutely beautiful. There's mosaics throughout this church and a lot of them have been restored. I'll show you some images of people restoring them. Here we've got some of the cherubs crawling through the grapevines, trying to pick the grapes before the birds get to them. However, you know, we're looking at basically a, a building that's over a thousand years old. It's gone through several restorations and unfortunately some of these mosaics were destroyed in the past, primarily in 1620. So this is how the church looks today. Again, the altar in the center, double columns, Corinthian styles, and we have that wonderful barrel vault going around the outside, the circumference of the altar. It is the earliest surviving of the centrally planned churches. And originally it was a mausoleum to Emperor Constantine's daughter, Constantina. So here's an even better view of the ambulatory. And these walls are also faced with marble, and then you have the mosaics above them. And here we have some cleaning and restoration. Now, I've mentioned mosaics a few times in this lecture, and I want to give that term a definition so we know exactly what we're talking about. So mosaics are artworks that are created by combining small pieces of stone, glass, or tile. And we can arrange those objects in such a way that they form recognizable patterns or images. Now, mosaics can be placed anywhere. In that previous image, you saw the person cleaning the mosaic that was on the ground. But you can also have it on the ceiling, like we saw in the ambulatory along that barrel vault around the center of the Santa Costanza. But they can also, and more regularly, be on the walls of a church. And when I speak about that there's glass being used in the work itself, not only can the glass be flat so that the mosaic is still has this very smooth surface, but when we look at them at mosaics on the walls and on the ceilings, the glass can actually protrude out from the image to capture the flickering candlelight. And it really adds to the ambiance of these early Christian churches. This was among the most popular artistic mediums we're going to find during this time period, from the late Roman Empire all the way through the Middle Ages, and usually kind of waning off around the 1300s. But still today, people use mosaics as, as something very popular in terms of craft today. 
so the next work we're going to look at is a sarcophagus. And this is the sarcophagus of Junius Bazus. It is an absolutely incredible block of marble that's been carved. It is roughly four feet by eight feet. And today you would find it in St. Peter's Cathedral. Junius Bazus was a governor of the Roman Empire. And of course, this is the time where Constantine is making Christianity not only acceptable, but also legal. And so we have this early work where we have a lot of iconography from the Christian religion. Christ here is looked at as fairly young in this work, right? He doesn't even have a beard, but he's also got his feet resting on the head of a river god, which would have been one of the pagan gods. And this shows the triumph of Christianity. He wears very traditional clothing here, but the figures are not classical by any means. Um, the bodies are kind of short and the heads of the figures are a little bit too large for the bodies. Um, and this is also an example of what's called high relief sculpture. So these figures are carved from the original block of marble. They are not carved separately and placed up against the marble. They are from that original marble block. And of course, this is incredibly difficult for someone to carve. Most of the carvings we have from this time period are fairly small, such as the ivory carving of the suicide of Judas, as well as the crucifixion. And so we have the hanging of Judas off to the left, his suicide, and then the crucifixion off to the right. Very geometric, not very lifelike, and you can definitely see art kind of reverting back to how it was prior to the classical age. And a figure like this, this is a more common size. Probably you're looking four inches by six inches for this work. Now let's move on to another structure, which is the mausoleum of Gala Placidia. And this is a really cool structure to me, not just because of the shape. I mean, you're looking at Santa Costanza is, you know, circular. The next church we're going to look at, the Church of San Vitale, is octagonal. This one is kind of plus shaped when you look at it from above. And it's also been constructed of bricks ripped up from the ancient Roman Empire. And you know, when we think about architecture today, when we build something new, that's exactly what we do. We clear the land and everything we use is new material. During this age, we're doing a lot of recycling. So these Blocks, for instance, came from ancient Roman streets or buildings to, in order to construct this mausoleum. It's built 75 years after Santa Costanza, and the Roman Empire at that time is much different. During the 3rd and 4th centuries, the Roman Empire has been split, it's been rejoined, and now it's been split again. We also have the migration of different peoples and those attacking the city of Rome, such as the Ostrogoths, Visigoths, and Huns. So Gala Placidia is the daughter of Emperor Theodosius. Theodosius is the ruler of the eastern half of the Roman Empire, and that's going to be based in Constantinople. Theodosius' son, and Gala Placidia's brother, is Honorius and he rules the western half of the Roman Empire. But he's the one who moves the capital of Rome, which is almost constantly under attack, to a more secure location in the city of Ravenna. And so that's why this building is where it's at. Gala Placidia's son is going to end up taking over the ruling of the western half of the empire. Originally, it was said she was buried here, very much like Constantine's daughter was buried in Santa Costanza, but there's still some contention about that. Let's go ahead and take a look inside the building. And again, we can see all the mosaics on the walls and on the ceiling. You have marble uh, up on the bottom of the walls, up to about seven or eight feet, and then the mosaics begin. 
What's really great about these mosaics is that the glass that is used on the walls and on the ceilings that's set into the mosaics um, is actually protruding out. And so it's catching the candlelight and almost making it, when the candlelight hits it, making it look like the image is shimmering. This is the Christ as the Good Shepherd, uh, which is right over the entrance wall. So it would also be the last mosaic you would see when you were leaving this building. Um, this is a very natural image of Christ, a uh, very natural body position. The clothing fits well. He is still beardless at this time, like we saw in the sarcophagus of Junius Bazus. The work is also very symmetrical with three sheep on either side of the figure of Christ. And here's another really great image here. And a close up of that mosaic. Now we're going to talk about the Church of San Vitale. Now this church, like the mausoleum of Gala Placidia, is up in the city of Ravenna. And it's built about a century after the mausoleum and two centuries after the church of Santa Costanza. What's cool about this structure is that it is very recognizably octagonal. And even it has that octagonal tower up above the main structure of the church. It is an absolutely massive building, but when you go into it, there is a sense of lightness and airiness. There is a tremendous amount of windows surrounding us and also quite a bit of mosaics. But take a look at the way that the columns are presented to you. We have them one on top of the other in like the first and second story. And it's very similar to how the columns are presented to us in the outside of the Colosseum. As we move into the altar area, I want to call attention to the two lowest mosaics, one on either side of the altar. And I'll show you close-ups of those in just a moment. But also the columns here on the ground floor are not conventional Doric, Ionic, or Corinthian. They're almost like some type of hybrid, and they almost look as if they have two capitals together. So when you get up to the altar, when you look to the left, you have the Emperor Justinian and his attendants. And Justinian here, and we're gonna take a look also at Theodora, his wife, who's across the aisle, but we'll start with Justinian first. Um, this is definitely a work of propaganda. Just like that uh, sculpture of the Augusta Suprema Porta, where it was kind of stationed throughout the empire, letting you know who the emperor was. It's the same thing here. Justinian nor his wife ever set foot into the city of Ravenna. So this is letting you know that the emperor here is still the emperor of the Roman Empire, and he is the leader of the church. He is standing in, in this image as Christ. We've got that halo around his head. He's also carrying a bowl that you're going to have bread in to serve as part of the Eucharist. He's surrounded by military as well as spiritual advisors. You can see also that the image is very flat. It's very frontal. And there's really no horizon or ground line that these individuals are standing on. They're kind of hovering in space in a way. Across the altar is Theodora and her assistants, and she is standing in as Mary. You can see embroidered on her gown are the three magi. And we also have her uh, with a halo around her head. She's carrying a goblet which would carry the wine serving as the other half of the Eucharist. 
Another work showing Justinian as propaganda is Justinian as World Conqueror. And this is a work made out of ivory, approximately 10 inches in height. And you can kind of see him riding in there at the center of the work on a horse, very much like that sculpture of Marcus Aurelius. And here's our example here. Above, we have the image of Christ, again, beardless. The soldier at the left is something that personifies victory. We have the woman underneath the horse, which almost looks like she's getting trampled, is the personification of the earth. And then below that, we have barbarians that are coming in, attacking the city of Italy from the east and west. And it looks like as if he's trampling them as well. However, um, they really have the upper hand and they are slowly taking over Italy. Then we're going to look at the Hagia Sophia. And no one pronounces the name of this church correctly. You'll hear it all sorts of different ways, but it is officially Hagia Sophia. The name translates into Holy Wisdom. The church is located in Constantinople, which today is Istanbul, and that's when the minarets are built during that transition. In 1453, the Turks take over the city. That church then becomes a mosque, and today it is a tourist attraction. It's a museum, and you can even schedule your wedding to take place here. So this is a structure commissioned by Justinian, who we just saw in the mosaic, uh, five years into his reign. And it was built to revive the glory of the Roman Empire. And of course, all these emperors and all the rulers are trying to create large buildings that will kind of be their namesake in centuries to come. But here what's happened is there was some public uprising and the church that was on the site of the Hagia Sophia was destroyed. And so in order to stop the people from rioting, putting everyone to work, were these monumental, was this particular monumental building project. It took five years to build, and that is significant because there was no structure like this that had been built before. We're not going off a predetermined plan this was something that was brand new. And primarily, we're going to be looking at the idea of placing a round dome on top of a square building, which is what you see there in the center. And this is the first time it's been done in a major building project. Now, also, one thing to note about the minarets around the corners there. The minarets are not a 90 degree angle perpendicular to the ground. They are about a degree or two slightly off. We had talked about early on in the Greek Empire uh, ideas of intasis and how the Parthenon itself was not a very vertical structure um, that utilized straight lines. There were all sorts of curves. Here, the minarets are just about a degree off so that when we see them from a distance, they look straight. And again, we have those beautiful ornate carvings on top of the columns. The church has gone under some major restoration. You see scaffolding under the dome there at the left. The space inside the dome is so large, it would incorporate the Statue of Liberty and the torch she is holding in her hand would just barely touch the center of that dome. So this is the dome we're gonna concentrate on and you can see around the four corners these are what are called pendentives, and they are defined as curving wall sections set between arches in order to support a dome. Now, I will tell you also, 
this is the second dome. The first one fell, uh, and I'm not sure if it was because of the lack of building knowledge or if there was an earthquake. This is an area that's very prone to earthquakes, but the first one did fall and collapse. This is the second dome. It's been around for 1,500 years. I do trust it. Uh, so upper left-hand corner again, it says the pendentive is a triangular segment of a sphere filling in the corners of a room in order to form a circular support for a dome. So these are basically curving wall sections and they're supporting that edge or circumference of the dome. And it almost looks like it's floating from all those windows and that light coming in at its base. It's a lot different than the dome we see on the Pantheon because the dome on the Pantheon is supported by a circular structure. In the Hagia Sophia, it is a square structure. And here's a zoom in of those pendentives. And this is something that is still used today. When we look at, in the image at the left, we have Caesar's Palace, and it's, which is in Las Vegas, Nevada. This is pendentives around that circular dome up above. So it is still used today. What's also really cool about the Hagia Sophia is that we are uncovering a tremendous amount of mosaics that had been plastered over. During the 7th and 8th centuries, iconoclasts were going around destroying graven images. And in order to preserve these, church officials would plaster them over. But with the succession of generations and the passing of time, the idea of these mosaics were, had disappeared. And so with today's radar and such, we're able to locate these and do restoration work. And you'll find a lot of these uh, videos on YouTube, uh, particularly news stories of these restorations. And I think at this point, it will be a good idea to bring to a close our lecture on late antiquity and Byzantium.